You're listening to Worth Electronics What's Up Radio Podcast, where each week we are seeing what's up in the world of electronics and PCB design. We'll be checking in with leading industry experts and our very own Worth Electronic technical specialists who are going to shine a light on interesting topics such as energy harvesting, wireless power transfer, EMI issues, and so much more. Tune in to get technical design tips and applications during your commute, at your desk, or wherever you might be with Worth Electronics' What's Up podcast. Today's podcast comes directly from a recent webinar presented by Worth Electronics' own Gelio Andrev. Gelio is a product manager in the Opto Electronics area of Worth Electronic and is one of our go-to technology experts on the subject. Today, Gelio will dive into the basics of infrared lighting and then cover everything from data transfer to biometrics. You'll gain an understanding of the difference between infrared LED and other LED technology and when and how to use photo detectors in your design. He will also explain how to match the emitter and detector and then finish off with real life application examples. Enjoy this presentation of Infrared Revealed with Gelio and Driv. Uh, I will start now with a short overview of uh, the topic for today. We will start with the basic infrared LED introduction and what infrared LEDs are, the electro-optical properties and uh, posing and switching. Then I will go further with some photo detector basic information. What is a photo detector? What is the difference between a diode and transistor? And then after a short overview of uh, matching an infrared emitter and detector, I would like to finish with some application examples of, uh, that we developed in our lab. So first, uh, let's talk about what is an infrared LED or what is the best component of an infrared LED. Uh, you can see a small sketch of an infrared LED, the main components are the housing or the package, the encapsulation, the gold contacts or the contact into a PCB and the die. So when we have all this together, then we can put it into a single package and uh, get an infrared LED. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the main ingredient to make also the perfect LED is also to uh, put the correct parts together so that you have the optimum output of your pre-selected chip. You have a nice encapsulation so the light comes out and uh, most importantly also for the customer important to, to have the correct package. All this we will go through now in the following pages. First of all, the infrared LED or the pre-selected chip or die. We use in our production uh, two different wavelengths of 850 and 940 nanometers uh, dies for the two, two main emitting wavelengths of infrared. The infrared can also be identified with this 850 and 940 nanometer with two different wavelength parameters, the peak and centroid wavelength. In the photo, you can see the peak wavelength is the peak of the maximum emission or where the power, the emitted power is the maximum. The centroid wavelength on the other side is more or less a quality of the infrared LEDs that can be defined also as how our detector perceives the, the infrared light. Actually, the centroid wavelength gives the middle part of the emission spectrum. So on the left and on the right side, the energy that consists into the peak has the same value. And the centroid wavelength just divides the spectrum in two energetically equal parts. 
Uh, what's important also to know about the infrared LEDs and the chips, as we are now talking about invisible LED light, we don't use anymore the standard values of lumen and candela, and we define our LEDs through the radiant uh, parameters. This is the milliwatt or the milliwatt per steradian, which we measure in, in our lab following the CIE norm. And due to the high variety of chips and packages, we can offer different uh, power output ranging from 1 milliwatt per steradian up to 100 milliwatt per steradian. This also would depend a lot on the viewing angle of the product and not only the chip. Of course, in our portfolio, we also have the high power LEDs with uh, intensity, radiant intensity, more than 300 milliwatt per steradian. But what is now important, except the chip, as I said, is the viewing angle. The viewing angle gives, is given by the right encapsulation. You will find in our portfolio a lot of different lens, lenses or encapsulations with uh, flat lens or uh, radial lens that give a different viewing angle. The viewing angle is the parameter that can show you, okay, where my light or infrared emission is going. Do I have a bright uh, viewing angle, a broad angle, so I can illuminate at a short distance a very large area? Or do I have a narrow viewing angle? Or in other words, if I can use my, my emitter to shine on a very lengthy distance, but in this case also uh, shining over or illuminating, irradiating more or less a very narrow area. As you can see, the dark blue curve of a very high emission uh, viewing angle, we have a very high illumination. In our case, our product we can provide the viewing angle products from 20 to 150 degrees, depending on the application that you have. If it's a short range, wide angle or long range application. Another important parameter about the encapsulation is, of course, that it should not be absorbing. That's why we use uh, special silicones that are uh, transparent in the inferent range. So we have almost 100% of the light that is emitted from the chip to be exited out, to exit out and to be used. Now, uh, I would like to finish up the topic about the composition of the LEDs and come up later and then turn our attention to two of the most important parameters. One of them is the switching of the LEDs. In this case, we are talking about the infrared LEDs. Those are uh, light emitting diodes that have an invisible spectrum. So, and basically they differ a lot with LEDs that we use for uh, signaling or indicators or uh, general lighting. The most properties of the most important parameters or why we use these LEDs is we shine on something or we detect something. Uh, when we are using detection then it's also important that we can basically don't need the LED to work all the time. We can use the LED in so-called post pulse mode. In order to use pulse mode, we need to have a very nice rise and fall time. Uh, usually our LEDs have a very high switching frequency, which is in the range of around 10 nanoseconds, uh, which converted in frequency is around 100 megahertz. 
the most important parameters in this case that define the, the switching times or why an LED has a switching time. This is the parasitic and junction capacitance of the LED and the parasitic resistance of the whole package. If you can remember, this is why we use a gold contact because we can have a lot better solderability on the PCB and then thus reduce some of the parasitic re resistance that we brought in our uh, designs or schematics. Another way to reduce the switching time is the capacitance. We use pre-selected chip and dies with a low capacitance so that we can have a very low switching times. Usually the switching times is measured uh, between 0 and 100 percent, 10 or 90 percent and 80 and 20 percent. Those parameters can give a lot different times. But by us in Virt Electronic, we use the typical rise and fall time of 10 to 90 percent, which you can see on the second graph. This is a lot more accurate for people that want to use the LED for a full off and full on state compared to the 20-80% measurement. This is why we, we give this value in, in our case. Except for the switching of the LEDs, uh, important is that we are able also to pulse the LEDs. Posting the LEDs means that we can basically go above the continuous current and basically use short pulses to extend the output power or the range of our LEDs even higher, even more than what uh, we have uh, you can see here a short graph of a pulse capability measurement for our LEDs, for our high power LEDs. This is basically done in a standard uh, thermal chamber following uh, JEDEC 51 standard. Uh, what we need to say here is, yes, it's possible to pulse your LED with a higher current than the available continuous current. Why is this possible? Because we refer to the different pulse parameters as ex explained, uh, as shown above the graph. We have a duty cycle, uh, on time and off time. And in the off time, an LED uses uh, off time or the chip uses the off time to cool down and to regenerate itself so it doesn't break because if we see a standard chip of 8 by 8 mil or 0 0.05 uh, square millimeter if we drive it with 0 0.7 ampere then we will have with a forward voltage of around 2 volt we will have around 1 watt uh, already into the LED so this means that we will have around 1 watt per 0.05 millimeter square. If we convert this into watt per centimeter square, then we will reach even more heat generation than a standard uh, oven in our house. In this case, we really need to implement a duty cycle to be able to run the LED in higher currents. As you can see from the curve, for example, if we have a posing time of one milliseconds or one E minus zero three, then depending on the duty cycle, we can have different properties. For example, if we use a duty cycle of 50% or 50% on, 50% off time, then we see that we can reach probably around uh, 75 percent higher than our standard current but if you reduce the duty cycle to 20 percent then 
we see that we can have around 300% more current than the standard current that we use for, for continuous and so on going on until we can reach a border limit where we can also damage the, the LED. This allowed post current depends also on the duty cycle, but it also depends on the chip size and the packaging. So how fast the LED can, can cool down or turn off. If you need further information about this uh, and how our LEDs are driven, then please contact us at the emails given later so we can discuss it further. Now I would like to go on further and uh, present to you the photo detectors. What are photo detectors? Yeah, of course, now we have an infrared emitter, a light source that emits a light that is not acceptable, not perce perceivable from human eye, the 850 or 940 nanometers. We still need some way to detect this data, to detect this light or to get the signal that we are emitting. Then there are two different options. We can have a detector in the form of a photodiode or a phototransistor. There is a main difference of what is a photodiode and a photodetector. I guess each one of you know, knows what is a diode. So a photodiode would be the same as a diode having an anode and a cathode and generate current by light falling on it. The difference between a phototransistor here, a phototransistor is like a normal transistors where we have the base controlled by our light source. So the main difference between a diode and the transistor here will be the current that is generated. A diode will have a photocurrent generated in microamperes because we don't we have just a simple conversion of light into electrons a phototransistor on the other side has a collector current in milliampere it means that here the transistor will work again as a transistor and we have a lot of gain this means that our photocurrent will be multiplied and will have a stronger signal and this means signal to noise ratio. Uh, the other main difference between the photodiode and phototransistor is also the response time or the switching time. A photodiode, because of the direct uh, transition or direct conversion of light into electricity, have a very short switching time in nanoseconds. On the other side, a phototransistor which has a gain and, and the current is, or the photocurrent is not directly converted from the uh, light coming out, have a lot lower switching time in microseconds. But of course, this lower switching times is compensated by the better uh, collection or the better sensitivity of a phototransistor. So this is yeah the main difference when we decide, okay, what type of emitter I need to use with my uh, light. Do I need something fast and I have a very low signal to noise ratio, or I need a transistor that will improve my signal to noise ratio and sensitivity. And for example, I will not need it in, I don't need it in, a very good reaction time or a reaction time in microseconds will still work for me. Another option to choose between the emitters, this is uh, important and it's both for transistor and for diode. Where do I put my emitter or where do I perceive my light? Uh, So, if we have a 
diode that is uh, somewhere outside in the sun or in a very well illuminated room. I will have a lot of noise coming out from my uh, surrounding light. In this case, I would consider making my emitter or my detector use a detector with a daylight blocking filter as below. As you can see, in this case, a daylight blocking filter will just block all the, the light between 700 nanometers, or this is more or less the border of the visible range of the visible light. So my emitter will have a more stable signal and less signal, less noise that is coming from the ambient light. In our case, our, our products are available with and without daylight filter. And then, this is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this is now how I would define our perfect match. When we have an emitter or a detector, and then if we need something that is working and is not that, uh, is working somewhere that we don't care about the uh, ambient light, then 850 nanometer emitter can be very well coupled with a detector without a daylight filter. Then uh, we have almost 59% of uh, sensitivity of the photo detector. And in case we have a very sensitive area or we need to be very, very sensitive and get a very high signal to noise ratio, then our suggestion would be to go to a 940 nanometer uh, emitter combined with a daylight filter detector. Then we are in the range where our emitter and detector have 100% match in the maximum sensitivity. What further we can suggest to you if you have to pair your emitter and detector, we have the same package and the same uh, footprint for each emitter and detector and uh, they can be very well chosen from our uh, database. You can find all our products in our online catalog. As you can see on the left side the infrared emitter uh, with the different sizes and forms and uh, the different viewing angles and on the right side, we have the emitter and detector with the correct size and form, of course. And if you need to test your product first and, and uh, do some experimenting in the lab, don't forget you can also get the infrared LED design kit, which is full with all the different sizes and uh, forms, and it offers uh, free lifetime review of the products. If you need this, you can always contact your local representative to ask for some more information about the infrared design kit. Now, after I have the introduction of uh, the product, I would like to turn your attention to some of our applications, uh, which we also try it into the, in our lab and uh, we can discuss them in details if you need uh, at, at later points. But yeah, as you can see, the main applications where we can use our emitters are the automatic switches for touchless hygiene systems, security cameras, light barriers and automatic doors different touchless screens, biometrics and uh, different home appliance where the ambient uh, recognition system need to work. One of the first applications that we did in our lab was to make a non-invasive non uh, oxygen uh, measurement tool or basically we built a biometric or pulse 
meter based on oximetry. How did this work? We just have an LED and a detector on both sides or on one side aimed at our vein, vein. And the infrared light then gets reflected from the hemoglobin in our blood vessels. And then with the human pose, we are changing the reflection or the hemoglobin uh, concentration. So each pose can basically be, be tested with a different, uh, with a detector. To do this, we just put our emitter and detector, uh, and then we build a low pass and high pass filter and an amplifier and connected them with a microprocessor so we can get the results. And as you can see here, we have a very nice uh, diagram of the systolic and the diastolic uh, blood flow or the inflow and outflow of the blood. So basically the distance or the period uh, given on the spectrometer is one pulse or one heart uh, pump in each of in each case so in this case with just uh, 10 components from our catalog we were able to convert the first or a very simple pulse measurement device on this, we have also written an application note and we have some interesting reference design which can be found on our website. What other uh, applications we are now developing is data transfer. It's a lot easier to have a data transfer between an emitter and detector. If you consider the most simple one, this is a remote control where I can press a button and a signal would be sent with invisible light to my uh, TV or my stereo. And then the program will be turned on and off, the volume will be turned on and off. If we consider that the switching time is up to 100 megahertz, then we can use this in even more complicated uh, applications. The benefit of this. Uh, data transfer is that compared to radio frequency, our infrared signals are easier to use. There are no radiation restrictions at all at the moment, and the bandwidth, the spectrum that we have here, is a lot broader than the radio frequency. Response time compared to radio frequency is also with the speed of light. And basically, the benefit and the drawback in, in this case, it's a very secure connection that needs a direct contact between emitter and detector. So without direct contact, there will be no signal transfer. Uh, what other applications are the different detectors, transmissive or reflective detectors, as you can see here. In a transmissive detector, uh, we can think about different light barriers that can be used for different security zones. When there is a signal between, or when there is nothing between the emitter and detector, they create something like a light barrier. If something crosses this light barrier, or there is an interruption of the signal, then a uh, uh, distress signal or a uh, red lamp can say no there is something that is passing through so i need to to shut down ers can be used in this case for a short range and long range application to cover big areas uh, what other applications here are the reflective detection for example if we get a smoke detector so we have some kind of uh, radiation and as we know smoke will uh, convert or will reflect light into a different angle so if there is smoke we can detect it with infrared light 
and change of uh, reflective signal. Uh, further applications include license plates, recognition, uh, automated doors, and so on. Uh, with this, I would like to finish up my summary uh, and summarize my, my talk. Uh, we covered the information about what are different infrared emitters and detectors. And uh, based on the application, I guess everybody of you can find the correct uh, footprint, the correct viewing angle and the correct power output of our infrared LEDs and the matching photodiode on phototransistor based on the application. And depending on the field of applications, if you have any further questions, please contact us or your local sales representative so we can answer your corrections. This podcast was taken from an updated Worth Electronic webinar. To view the materials and replay the webinar on demand, visit www.we-online.com slash webinars or click the link attached in this podcast. You can also download the complete LED application guide at we-online.com slash app notes. You're listening to Worth Electronics' What's Up radio podcast, where each week we are seeing what's up in the world of electronics and PCB design. We're checking in with leading industry experts and Worth Electronic technical specialists who will shine a light on interesting topics such as energy harvesting, wireless power transfer, EMI issues, and so much more. Tune in to get technical design tips and applications during your commute, at your desk, or wherever you might be with Worth Electronics' What's Up podcast.